Hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Clapham. Welcome to Global Health Pandemics 101, offered by the Global Health Center at the Geneva Graduate Institute. I think it's clear to everybody that human rights have come under strain during this pandemic, whether it's questions of the right to life with regards to people dying, questions of freedom of association or assembly, people wanting to move about with freedom of movement, or even questions of freedom of expression in the context of a degree of misinformation. The question I'm going to try and address is, does looking at this with a human rights lens help at all? And what are the shortcomings for human rights in this context? I'll structure this around four concepts. The first would be obligation. The second is limitation. The third is derogation. And the last is cooperation. These are all terms of art in human rights law, but if you understand a little how they work in the technical sense, it may help to structure arguments or maybe even win an argument on human rights grounds in this context. So if I turn to obligation, states, international organizations, corporations and individuals all have obligations under international human rights law. This could be in connection with the right to life, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, freedom of expression and so on. Now, there are even obligations to prevent human rights violations, prevent loss of life, prevent the spread of the pandemic. And there are obligations to protect people, obviously from threats to their health, but also to threats to their human rights from other individuals or from corporations. Now, this all sounds good in, in technical terms, but in practice, how does it really work? If, if one person has the right to life because they've contracted COVID and they need to go on a ventilator, what about the other person who hasn't contracted COVID, who has a pre-existing condition and also needs a ventilator? There will be limited resources and simply framing your claim as a question of the right to life doesn't necessarily help. And even if the case comes before a judge, Judges might feel that they're not necessarily in the best position to decide something, even if it's a human rights case, because the allocation of resources in such a context is really perhaps best left to elected representatives, the executive, experts, hospital authorities, and so on. So what is clear is that these rights have to be protected in a way which is not discriminatory. But on the other hand, there are questions of democracy that kick in here and who should really be taking the decision. So having said that the question has to be decided in a non-discriminatory way, what would actually happen when a decision maker is asked to resolve something on human rights grounds? Human rights claims can help to remind the authorities that they have a duty to respond and that their decisions have to be taken in a just and fair way. But what happens when a group of anti-vaxxers want to demonstrate in the streets with no masks and in close proximity, and the government feels that this will lead to the spread of the disease? So in order to understand how this clash of rights, the right to demonstrate against the right to health from people who are going to be infected, how this works, we really have to turn to this other concept of limitation. So many human rights are structured where the individual is proclaimed to have a right, but then in the second paragraph, usually in a treaty text, it will say these rights can be restricted or limited under four conditions or four steps. So first of all, there has to be a legitimate aim to the restriction. So in my example of people who want to assemble and demonstrate, freedom of assembly can be restricted, for example, for the protection of the rights of others, the right to health of other people who might get infected by this massive meeting. That would be called a legitimate aim. So the restriction has to be for a legitimate aim. It can't be to keep the government in power or because it's inconvenient or because there might be some economic uh, cost. It has to be one of the listed aims. But the protection of the rights of others is there and the protection of the right to health would be included in that. And that was one of the main tensions during the pandemic. But there are three other conditions. Secondly, the restriction has to be prescribed by law in a precise and accessible way. So if the way in which this demonstration was prohibited was not done in a way where the organizers could know about it and it didn't follow the legal channels and it was ambiguous, that would constitute a violation of their human rights because although there was a legitimate aim, it wasn't prescribed by law. The third restriction is that the third limitation, sorry, is that the restriction has to be proportionate to the legitimate aim. 
So a complete ban on any meetings, for example, might not necessarily be proportionate or necessary because maybe you could have a demonstration but with social distancing and masks and so on. So there'll be a test. Not only is there a legitimate aim being claimed, but is the way in which the restriction is imposed proportionate and necessary to that end. And lastly, I think it's fair to say that you have to be able to challenge these restrictions before a court of law or some authority that could suspend it. So there has to be a possibility to challenge the way in which the human rights has been restricted. So those would be the four conditions for limiting someone's rights. So it's not enough to claim your human rights. It doesn't make you right. You'd have to do this four-stage test to see if the apparent interference with your right is justified as a matter of law. Now, it could be that we have some evidence now that governments have been using these limitations, not just in order to protect the right to health of other individuals or in a reasonable way to prevent public disorder, but in fact to restrict freedom of expression by the opposition groups which are against the government. Not just a question of vaxxers, anti-vaxxers, but questions of political opposition. So there's been, I think it's fair to say, a degree of opportunism by certain governments to say, because of COVID, we have to close down public demonstrations, we have to close down freedom of expression, we have to close down NGOs, we have to close down political debate, we have to close down certain things on television and so on. And often that is phrased in the language of public emergency. Now, that brings me to the third topic, which is derogation. Again, this is a term of art, and it's quite a formal process, that a government can claim that if there is a threat to the life of the nation and a public emergency, and arguably a pandemic could constitute such a threat, that not only can rights be limited, but they can be derogated from in a much more draconian way. So in addition to that limitation, it may be that there is a blanket ban or even restrictions on fair trial or questions of detention, which go way beyond the normal set of limitations that apply in human rights law. Now, the formal aspect of this is that the derogation has to be notified, for example, to the UN Secretary General if it's a UN treaty or to the Secretary General of the Council of Europe if it's a Council of Europe treaty. And it has to detail which rights are being derogated from and the extent to which this is necessary in the face of the emergency. Now, there's been a bit of a debate in the literature and amongst uh, human rights activists as to whether it's better to push down the route that governments are going to limit human rights and to focus on that or to suggest that in the case of an emergency, maybe there should be derogations. To be honest, I don't think you can claim that one or the other is more suitable. It will depend a bit on the national situation. For example, no, some national parliaments ha will be in control of derogations. And so a derogation for one month would have to be renewed by the parliament. So it might be arguably better to have human rights limited through derogation because then there's some democratic control over how long the derogation lasts and what is the content of the derogation, whereas the limitations could just pass without much scrutiny because to challenge them could take years of process through the courts. Those are sort of technical issues which would have to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. My point is when people say human rights can be limited, you would use the four tests that I referred to earlier. And when people are talking about derogation, it's a rather different legal regime. Now, the last part I wanted to talk about is cooperation. Um, this raises a whole series of obligations on states under treaty law, which oblige them to cooperate in the context of a pandemic on research, on sharing medical equipment, on sharing supplies, um, protective clothing and so on, but also to coordinate amongst themselves to reduce the economic impacts of the pandemic. So they would work not only to relieve uh, people in the most vulnerable positions who have been affected by the pandemic in an economic way, but also to cooperate for economic recovery. This could also refer to the voting powers of states in a body like the IMF, the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, so that development projects or loan arrangements or loan relief 
should be organized in a cooperative way, respecting the human rights of those most affected by the pandemic, not only in the countries that are voting, but in the countries most at risk. That's obviously hard to enforce, but it's worth reminding states that they have this obligation when they meet in an international context. Now, lastly, the most tricky area to explain, but also because it's a moving uh, target, is the obligation on states to ensure that everybody has access to the vaccines. And that, in turn, might imply reducing the intellectual property rights of companies that have invaded, invented the vaccines. So there's currently a discussion going on at the World Trade Organization to ensure that there is a waiver of intellectual property rights so that vaccines can be reproduced or manufactured in other countries outside of the normal places where they're being manufactured under copyright or under patent, I should say, and then distributed um, at low cost to all the people who would need them. Obviously, in the Western world, the rate of vaccination is quite high, but in the global south, it is particularly low. And part of this relates to the cost of the vaccines and the demands by some Western states, as well as the companies, that their copyright or their uh, patent or their intellectual property rights are protected. Now, that obviously produces a clash of rights. There are intellectual property rights on the one hand and the human rights of people on the other side. What the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Committee of the UN has said or reminded us is that intellectual property rights are not human rights. They're a social product, they are a way of rewarding research, but they don't rank, if you like, in quite the same way as human rights. On the other hand, these are legally protected rights, which states have pledged to uphold through a treaty. So they have to waive those rights in the context of this WTO treaty called the TRIPS Agreement. What um, the UN Committee on Human Rights, oh, sorry, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has said is because these intellectual property rights have a social function, consequently states parties have a duty to prevent intellectual property and patent legal regimes from undermining the enjoyment of economic, social and cultural rights. From my perspective, these are two competing regimes and human rights can be used to argue that states should change their mind about how they are insisting on intellectual property rights at the WTO. But it is very hard to go before a court of law and claim that these human rights should override intellectual property rights, just as one shouldn't claim that intellectual property rights can override these economic, social and cultural rights. From a moral perspective, obviously the right to life is the most important lie, right. And we can argue, I think, quite convincingly that states ought to do everything they can to protect the right to life and reducing these intellectual property rights is obviously part of that demand. So I hope I've helped to show a little how you can use human rights argumentation. There are these four concepts to repeat, obligation, limitation, derogation and cooperation, which do quite different things. They're terms of art in law. But once you understand them, you might be able to make a convincing human rights case which will protect the dignity of individuals in the context of a global health pandemic. Thank you very much. And we will now turn to the quiz.